backyard, luxury lifestyle living, content related to that, video essays, commentary, reactions. This video, we're reacting to a video essay on the history of bait and giving our commentary. Videos by Thread Threadication. Thread Threadication. Yeah. Let's get into it. I'm trying to learn which are, so I'm gonna provide probably a little commentary, but obviously I make the video transformative because we're not gonna just sit here and watch bro video otherwise. Tamaki Nauga was born in Maibashi, Japan That's not how you on December work. 23rd of 1970. Nigo. Now, if that name doesn't sound familiar, Going it's ape, because like, Nigo would later become known as Nigo, but we'll talk about how he got that name in just a bit. Nigo grew up in a working class family with both of his parents working an exorbitant amount of hours, leaving him at home to entertain himself with toys and movies. And while this might make him sound Most a bit like, lonesome, I can assure you that like this any, period of time was kid. crucial to his development. Keep in mind that this was around the time that American movies like Star Wars were taking over the globe, and as a child, Nigo fell head over heels for American entertainment. In fact, at the age of six, he started collecting toys and figurines from his favorite movies, nah, that's with cool. his first piece being a Donald Duck plush toy. Little did he know it at the time, but this was- It seemed like Japanese children gravitate towards American shows and toys and stuff and vice versa, at least for like our generations. The start of what would eventually become one of the biggest collections of pop culture items in the world. We're going to talk more about this collection later in the video, but for now, just know that this interest started at a very early Going age. Ape, light, As Nigo. Nigo grew into his teen years, his interest expanded beyond toys and figurines into the often interceding worlds of music and fashion. At around the age of 16, he saved up his money to purchase a set of turntables with the intention of becoming a DJ. Nigo was particularly fascinated with hip-hop, and even began modeling his own style after LL Cool J, who was of course well known for his big chain, baggy clothes, and bucket hats. Now, even though hip hop music is what got Nigo initially interested in fashion, it wasn't until his discovery of Hiroshi Fujiwara that Nigo realized it was his passion. Now, if you don't know who Hiroshi Fujiwara is, he's the founder of Fragment Design and is widely considered to be one of the founding fathers of modern streetwear. Back in the day, Fujiwara had a column in the popular Japanese magazine Takarajima, and when Nigo discovered the column, he became obsessed with Fujiwara's ability to blend pop culture and fashion. Nigo was still young, but thanks to Fujiwara, he had now discovered his love for fashion. And after graduating from high school, it was this love for fashion that made him decide to move to Tokyo, which was a decision that would change his life forever. Upon arriving in Tokyo, Nigo enrolled in the Bunka Fashion College, which is widely regarded as one of the top fashion schools in the world. Moving to Tokyo was undoubtedly a change of pace from the mountainside city he had grown up in, but it turns out Nigo felt right at home in this new environment. Tokyo's bustling nightlife was the perfect. I wanted to visit to Tokyo so bad, and, and you could even say he got a little. My bad, y'all. I was really like listening. Like a lot of college so kids, my commentary he spent more time partying slipped. than studying, <laughs> and he would later go on to say that he learned absolutely nothing from his time at college. Now, even though like, he wasn't much from his studies, like my freshman one year. very important thing did happen during I got it together though. Luka, and that we, was we got it together. Takahashi. Jun Takahashi is the Japanese designer that would go on to create the legendary label Undercover. I'm gonna say yeah, Undercover. The fashion College at the same time as Nigo. A very popular the Japanese brand. Over their shared love for street I'm not super super deep into the Japanese Nigo brands, but I am a big lover of fashions. Fashions, by DJ fashions of <laughs> different types of fashion. Not only did Nigo become known for skills as American streetwear, a little bit into like the Japanese and some other styles. I'm trying to get more into the aesthetic of American hip hop. And in a twist of fate, his style caught the attention of none other than his idol Hiroshi Fujiwara. It comes as no surprise that Fujiwara has a keen eye for emerging streetwear trends. So when word got out that Nigo was setting trends in Tokyo's local streetwear scene, he knew it was the beginning of something special. Fujiwara then reached out to Nigo and offered him a position as his personal assistant. And from that point forward, the two began working together. In fact, this is how Nigo got his nickname. As the story goes, he was at a club one night when someone came up to him and said he looked exactly like Hiroshi Fujiwara and called him Hiroshi Fujiwara Nigo, they do look which alike. translates to Hiroshi Fujiwara number two. Having no problem being compared to his mentor, he adopted the nickname, and that is how Tamaki Nagao became known as Nigo. 
In his role as personal assistant, Nigo helped Fujiwara with a number of projects, and this included working on the aforementioned column in the Takarajima magazine. Remember that Nigo read this magazine religiously as a teenager, and that's actually where he first learned about Fujiwara, so for him to help Fujiwara create a column for the magazine just a few years later was a major milestone. That's dope, look at him manifesting. You can see here one of the first issues that Nigo worked on, and you'll notice that he makes a reference to Planet of the Apes, which, as you may know, is a film that would go on to be one of his major sources of inspiration. Then, in 1990, Nigo helped Fujiwara launch his streetwear label Good Enough, which would eventually become a staple in Japanese streetwear culture. This hmm. was an incredibly Never valuable heard of experience it. for Nigo because it allowed him to see firsthand everything that goes into starting a label from the ground up. But and they've been he may working. Not have learned much at fashion school. Helping Fujiwara launch Good Enough was all the education. They've been working. Needed. Just three years for later, years. in 1993, Nigo was finally ready to start his own venture into the world of fashion. 93. Nowhere. Nowhere. On April 1st of 1993, Nigo and Jun Takahashi opened a fashion boutique called Nowhere, named after the song Nowhere Man by the Beatles. By this point, Hiroshi Fujiwara's Good Enough was a resounding success, and Nigo and Takahashi were both looking for something new to work on. So Fujiwara encouraged them to open their own boutique where they could sell Good Enough, as well as a curation of other popular streetwear brands. They settled on opening the store in Yura Harajuka. That's At the time, dream. the Yura Harajuka area was a collection of small boutiques in the back streets of Tokyo's Harajuka district. Nowadays, this district is flooded with well-known streetwear and luxury labels, but back then, it was basically if-you-know-you-know -you -know status for local fans of punk and streetwear, and it didn't take long for Nowhere to become a popular spot. There was, however, just one problem. The store was basically divided into two different sections. On one side, you could find Jun Takahashi's selection of grungy, punk-style clothing, and on the other side, you could find Nigo's selection of streetwear and vintage sportswear, like Nike and Adidas. The problem was that Takahashi's side of the store was much more popular, and a large part of this had to do with the launch of Undercover. Like I mentioned previously, mm. Undercover is Jun Takahashi's label, and he released his first ever collection at Nowhere. It quickly became a bestseller, and while this was great for the store, it left Nigo thinking of ways that he could get the customers interested in streetwear. He knew he needed to find an idea, but it turns out that that- Japan has great streetwear. I'm, I'm really caught up in this joint right now. Like, this is a great- Great documentary. That idea was about to find him. So I was letting it play. The commissary could be better. As I'm starting to do these type of videos, that's my biggest thing. Like I don't want to infringe on people's hard work by just letting it play. Like I got to offer some type of value as I'm watching this. One, so that y'all, you know, wanna rock with me and watch these joints with me. And two, just respect to the creator, for real, for real. But now we get into the abating eight. In addition to Nigo and Jun Takahashi, Hiroshi Fujiwara had a third prodigy under his wing. And that third prodigy's name was Shinichiro Nakamura, better known as Skate Thing. Skate Thing was arguably the most in-demand graphic Skate designer thing. from this era of Japanese streetwear. And nowadays, he's the co-founder and owner of streetwear brand Kavem. But none of this would have happened if it weren't for Hiroshi Fujiwara. Much like what happened with Nigo, Fujiwara met Skate Thing through the local streetwear scene and instantly saw something special in his style. Fujiwara then introduced him to his first Apple computer. That's why they always Skate say it's about who you know. Design software, and the rest is Networking can definitely From help you build. From that point forward, Skating started working on projects with Fujiwara, and this meant he was now also spending more time with Nigo and Jun. Especially that back then. That being said, Skating was well aware of the problem that Nigo was dealing with at the store, and one night, by complete chance, he found the answer to that problem. What was Skating that? Skating shared Nigo's love for American entertainment, and on this night, he decided to sit down and have a five-hour marathon of the Planet of the Apes movie. As Okay, done, so to Nigo to let him know that he had found that's like any great artist, artist you draw inspiration from what you see. Of the apes. Now, if you didn't have the benefit of hindsight here, you might think that basing your whole brand around a single movie franchise isn't the best idea, but that's not the nah, way that's not work for them. Remember that Nigo had grown up obsessed with American entertainment, including movie franchises like this one. So, for him, this was an opportunity to combine his love for fashion hey. with his love for pop culture. They so hit Nigo on one, decided so. to go forward with the idea and settled on the name A Bathing Ape. 
The name is an obvious reference to the film, but it's also a reference to the Japanese expression, a bathing ape in lukewarm water, which is basically used to refer to young people who live relaxed, lavish lifestyles. Even though the full name of the Since brand is 93. a bathing ape, this was then abbreviated to just bape, which is what it is most commonly referred to as today. So once they got the name down, see, I don't even wear a bape like that. Skills to work and so I won't even hit. It's been going on since 93. Look at that. Logo. Nigo printed the logo on some shirts, put them up in the store, and for the first time ever, Bape was made available to the world. Even though this was Nigo's first real venture into the world of fashion, he knew exactly what he was doing from the very start. Between helping Hiroshi Fujiwara launch Good Enough, seeing his friend Jun Takahashi build undercover from the ground up, and opening his own streetwear boutique, he knew what it took to make a brand popular, and that's exactly what he did. From the very beginning, Nigo knew that he had to make Bape exclusive. He only sold it at his store, he only produced a limited amount, and he charged fairly high prices. That way, even though the brand was still new, it gave people the impression that Bape was a higher end brand. Before long, people started seeing the Everybody Apex logo does that around now. the city. And just like Nigo had planned, they all started coming to the store to try to get their hands on his t-shirts. Around this time, Skate Thing also added Bape's signature camouflage pattern into the mix, and this quickly became a fan favorite. Now Nigo wanted to keep Bape exclusive, but as you can probably imagine, he still wanted it to expand. So he didn't start mass producing t-shirts or anything like that, but he did so start yeah, say, what's the solution to that? other local boutiques. This helped build Bape's cult following in Japan, but okay. how exactly did the brand make its way overseas? Well, interestingly So he didn't enough, saturate the brand, but he just expanded a little bit. Music career. Through DJing, Nigo met the English electronic musician James Lavelle, and Lavelle introduced him to American graffiti artist Stash. Stash happened to own a streetwear boutique in New York called Recon, and after connecting with Nigo, he became one of the first stores in America to carry Bape. So just like that, Bape had made its way to New York City, and it wasn't long before people started to take notice. As I'm sure most of you probably know, New York rapper Biggie Smalls was one of the hottest names in hip-hop during the mid-90s. Not only was he known for his music, but he was also pretty well known for his style. Big chains, designer shades, Kooji, Versace, and then in 1994 he added Bape into the mix. You can see here Biggie wearing a camo Bape jacket in this 1994 photograph taken by the legendary photographer Sean Mortensen. Now according to some accounts, this jacket didn't actually belong to Biggie, and Mortensen just brought it to the photo shoot for him to wear. But whatever the case may be, this was the first time that Bape was introduced to the American rap scene. Meanwhile, back in Japan, that's the tough. brand was gaining momentum faster than Nigo could have ever expected. And while you might be thinking that's a good thing, he saw things differently. Remember that when Nigo started Bape, he wanted it to be exclusive. But by 1998, things had gotten a little bit out of control, and the brand was being sold at more than 40 different retailers in Japan. So in 1999, making what was undoubtedly a very risky decision, Nigo pulled Bape off the shelves at every single one of these retailers and opened the first ever flagship Bape store in Hong Kong. This easily could have backfired and halted the brand's momentum, but instead <clears throat> it did just the opposite. From that point forward, if you wanted Bape, there was only one place to get it, and that's where everyone went. I also want to quickly mention that around this time, Nigo had also started hosting the Worldwide Ape Head Shows, which were later renamed Worldwide Bape Head Shows. These were basically just music festivals that Nigo hosted for some of his favorite musicians and DJ friends, but they really helped develop Bape's cult following. By combining his passions for fashion and music to create the Bape Head Shows, Nigo was communicating that he had more to offer than just a cool t-shirt. He really wanted to push Bape's association with the world of music, and I guess you could even he say really he was wanted doing it to become a sort of lifestyle brand. So all of that being said, Bape was obviously on a hot streak, but looking back now, this was really just the beginning. Heading into the early 2000s, it really felt like everything Nigo touched turned They really been around for a long time. Bape introduced the iconic zip-up shark hoodie and of course the Bape stuff. Now the inspiration for the Bape The Bape stuff. Nigo basically wanted his own Nike model, and so he reimagined the Air Force One using patent leather and an array of flags. A lot of people don't like the bases. Air Force Ones were already extremely popular. I like them in because of what they stand the for. Bases released, they were an instant hit. Soldier boy, I got me some. I got, I got, I got me some bathing apes. Well, I got me some. From the shoe being just different enough. Yeah, I had to be there. Copy. I've heard the patent on the Air Force One had expired. I've even heard that Nike owned a stake in Bape, which of course is not true. But whatever the truth is, all we really know 
know is that Nike never. I might a be wrong, but didn't they come back? Open the door for the Bapes. Finally, one of Bapes staple and Sue. So Nigo started opening new Nike stores, went on the crazy Sue Sue rant like last year with major brands like Pepsi. But perhaps the single most important thing that happened in the early 2000s was meeting Pharrell. According to Pharrell, it all That's started really when took he the went to Jake the Jeweler, who, if you don't know, is an iconic jeweler in the world of rap music. Oh yeah, and there, Nigo was Jacob getting his Jacob pieces. Some guy in Japan was bringing him photos of Pharrell's chains and having him remake them in different colors. He didn't know it at the time, but this guy was, of course, Nigo. As we've discussed, Nigo really bases his personal style off of American hip hop, and he was such an avid fan of Pharrell that he wanted to wear the same chains he was wearing. After this, Pharrell didn't really give it too much thought, but fast forward a year and he's on a trip to Tokyo. While on the trip, Pharrell wanted to book some time at a studio, but he didn't have any local contacts and had trouble finding one. That was until Nigo found out through the grapevine that Pharrell was in the city and instantly reached out to offer him time at his personal studio. Pharrell accepted, but he had no idea what he was in for. Nigo's studio was actually just one part of a seven-story building that he used to house his cars, collectibles, and of course racks and racks of vape. It was upon seeing the building that Pharrell knew Nigo was special, and this was the beginning of their friendship. After Pharrell was done in the studio, the two of them went to dinner, and it was over the course of this dinner that Pharrell told Nigo he was actually thinking of starting his own streetwear brand, Billionaire Boys Club. Right away, Nigo offered to help him launch the brand, and before the night was even over, Skate Thing, who also designed the logo for Bape, had designed the now iconic Billionaire Boys Club logo. I'll Very also iconic. That this partnership we love Billionaire Boys Club. Spin-off label ice cream as well. So once the trip was over, Pharrell was ready to head back. Have some of that in my closet right now. Left, Nigo let him take as much Bape as he could carry. In poetic symbolism of the style revolution that was about to take place, Pharrell left all of his old clothes in Tokyo and flew back to America with a suitcase full of vape. When Pharrell got back to America, he started pushing Bape, BBC, and ice cream as much as possible. In the early 2000s, he was pushing that genre heavy. Find him wearing, and after they made appearances in his music videos, the demand for these pieces skyrocketed. It skyrocketed so much, in fact, yeah. that in 2005, Nigo opened Bape's first ever international location in New York City, and of course, the store's opening day party. The Reebok ice creams was, was crazy. After this, it wasn't long before Bape took America by storm. Just like he had always dreamed of doing, Nico had finally made his way into the American rap scene. Pharrell even brought him- I remember those. Those jumps was hard. Awards, which was one of the first times the American public got to see who was behind this hot new brand. So even though Pharrell is the one who really brought Bape to America, he wasn't the only person in <laughs> The RBK. Will Wayne was one of the early adopters of Bape. And many people credit him with helping to launch the brand further into mainstream popularity. And another major influence was Kanye West. Kanye is just as well known for his style as he is for his music. And during the graduation slash 808s and heartbreak era, he was wearing a lot of vape. In fact, Nigo and Kanye became close friends and collaborators during this period. Kanye appeared in several campaigns for Bape. Nigo produced the samples. Kanye for definitely put on for Bape, so. Pastel. And in 2007, they released the Kanye West Bape Studs, which featured Kanye's signature bear on a pair of brown and red Classic, Bapestas. classic shoe. This was shoe. just one of several collabs that Nigo put together during the 2000s, with some major ones including the Supreme Bape collab, the Cause collab, the Undercover collab, and the Star Wars collab, just to name a few. Above okay. all of these, though, I would have That's to guess that 2000s. the Bape Disney collab stands out as one of the most important to Nigo. Remember that as a kid, and they Nigo's still been going hard. Was a Duck he did Plush sell a bait. And, he was and now he got human made, though. Official bait branded Donald Duck plush toy. All things considered, the early 2000s were pivotal for Nigo. And it was starting to for feel sure, like the early 2000s to went was crazy for bait. Than ever. He started his own hip hop group called the Teriyaki Boys back in Japan. And he befriended major celebrities in music and fashion. You could even say he became a celebrity himself. Everything was looking up for Nigo, but trouble was right around the corner. What type of trouble he get into? I don't see that. Not Nigo. In 2009, Nigo stepped down as the president and CEO of Babe. That's a big change. the second time in the brand's history, it had expanded too quickly. On the surface, everything was fine, but in reality, Bape was losing money at a staggering rate and had accrued nearly yeah, nah. $50 million. Dollars oh, I said that can't be yes, solid. Bape was more popular than ever, but Nigo had started opening new it's stores probably like around semi -solid. the world, and he even opened yeah. Bape cafes, Bape hair salons, a Bape record label. To put it simply, Nigo's ambitions had led him to stray too far from Bape's core business model, and the brand as a whole was now.
now in jeopardy. Having run out of options, Nigo sold a 90% stake in the company to the Hong Kong-based IT group for less than $3 million. As part of the buyout, Nigo was contracted to remain the creative director of Babe for four years. And in 2013, when that contract expired, it wasn't renewed he got and perms. Nigo officially left Babe for good. He went got this permanent. In many ways a bitter okay, trend. Nigo. Even though Nigo was forced to leave Babe, there's no denying that he built what will go down as one of the most iconic streetwear brands in history. That being said, however, the general public noticed a pretty steep decline in the quality of designs after Nigo stepped away. And even when he was still on his four-year contract, it was fairly evident that his heart just wasn't in it. And that might be because he was focusing all of his attention on his next great project. He we made. In 2010, while still technically contracted as creative director of Babe, Nigo teamed up with Skating to launch a new label called Human Made. Human Made shares many aesthetic similarities to Babe, with its bright colors and bold graphics, but this new label is Nigo's attempt at something a bit more refined. Even though it hasn't lived up to the same level of hype as Babe, I have to think that's by design. This time around, I think Nigo's going to want to take things a bit slowly and not make the same mistakes he made with Babe. With Human Made, we aren't seeing stores pop up everywhere, and we're only seeing carefully selected collabs like this subtle Adidas collab. It goes without saying that Nigo is an amazing designer and creative visionary, but I think right now this is the best thing for him. He's already had it all and risen to the top of the fashion it's world. It's very so simple. Now, he's just laying low Human and really made. focusing in on his work. It's like of course, he is still keeping himself busy outside of fashion. As I mentioned earlier, he's Japanese. The largest Kiff. fashion and pop culture archivists in the world. In the same seven story human made, I got homies that rock with it. More than 10, I like it. Clothing, much of which I just haven't gravitated towards anything. He has collectible items and original pieces that I've seen from them yet. Like Star Wars, collectible toys, original Apple computers, a collection of vintage designer trunks, rare pieces of designer furniture, basically a small museum of anything he's ever been interested in. And I think that this massive collection is a reflection of Nigo's obsessive nature. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing. I mean, just think about it. He didn't want to just watch movies. He wanted to own parts of it. He didn't want to just listen to hip hop. He wanted to dress like LL Cool J, own the same chains as Pharrell, and start his own hip hop group. The same with streetwear. He didn't want to just sell other people's brands. He wanted to start his own brand. And when he did, he didn't stop until it was the biggest streetwear brand in the world. This drive is what makes Nigo so successful. And it's what makes me think that in the next few years, Human Made could become way bigger than it is right now. It could. Yes, he's laying low for a little bit, but knowing Nigo, it's only a matter of time before he finds this drive again. It could, but I think he wants to keep Human Made more of like a Anyways, low key brand. But yeah, that was the history of Babe from Thread. Uh, I be fucking the name up. History of Babe from Thread Education. Appreciate y'all rocking with me. I got more histories and more stuff that I want to watch from this channel. So get in with me.